All right, Paul, hey. we could we could talk off all the mic we want to, but it's not uh yeah, well, we might as well get it on record. Did you have a question for me? I do, yeah. Do you go by Mitch or Mitchell? Because I Mitch know is good. Okay, yeah, cool. Got it. Yeah. You know, my wife's mad at me. She calls him Mitchell, stuff like that. But yeah. Understood. Understood. Okay. So thanks for coming on. Um, I am a little fascinated with what's been going on in the meat industry. Um, and the I wouldn't call it fake, the substitute meat industry reading a lot about it. I did download your book. I started listening. I haven't heard the whole thing, but I started listening to it and reading it and so forth. And it's fascinating to me what's going on in the food labs of America, or maybe the world, I guess, where I think in the future, we won't be like raising and slaughtering animals. It'll be barbaric. And, and it certainly doesn't help the planet, all these cows and you know all the birds and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but let's go you know, backwards and you can share your, you know, your background, maybe where you're from, education, your business experience, and kind of how you came to start the Better Meat Company, you know? Sure, Mitch. So it's great to be talking with you. I'm honored that you're reading my book, Clean Meat. I hope you enjoy it or that you're listening to it at least. I am. Um, that, that, that's <laughs> yeah, great. I told you I was very excited when you said it was on Audible. I was like, oh, I got to do that because in, indeed, indeed. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm glad that you're uh, that you're consuming it in any format. Um, so, you know, look, the planet isn't getting any bigger, right? So humanity's footprint on the planet's getting a lot bigger, but the planet itself thing. is not getting any bigger. Right. And one of the primary ways we leave that footprint is through our food print, principally in the amount of meat that we eat. So since you're reading Queen Meat, you don't, you already know this, Mitch, but for your listeners, you know, look, it just takes a lot of land, a lot of water, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and more to raise and slaughter yeah. animals for food. Ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Right. Yeah, it's, it's truly un unbelievable um, compared to eating plants. So you know, the problem is that people want meat, you right. know, we're, we're a species that likes meat. And in fact, when people can afford meat, they start buying it. So if you look at uh, countries like China and India, where they have expanding middle classes, one of the very first things that people do when they escape poverty is start eating more meat. Even, now, in, even in India? Even in India, meat consumption is skyrocketing in India wow. right now. Yeah, better, exactly. better tell the cows, they're all walking around comfortable thinking there's not a problem. It, it, you know, they, they would be in for, they'll be in for a rude awakening. Yeah. Um, and, you know, yeah. Interestingly, by just by a, you know, a, a short little anecdote, India is actually a big uh, exporter of cattle products because while uh, many Hindus do not eat them, uh, they they still export a lot of uh, products that uh, Makes sense. Like right. Sure. Products. Still an industry. Right. They look, they make whiskey in Lynchburg, Tennessee. It's a dry town, <laughs> but you can't buy it there. Right. That's the same thing. Very good point. Very good point. So anyway, though, you know, look, the point is that people want meat. And so I believe that we can create meat experiences that use a fraction of the resources needed to raise and slaughter animals without the need for animals. Right. So, you know, if you think about like, you know, you were you were joking a moment ago, Mitch, about, you know, is it uh, is it substitute meat substitute? Like, what do you call it? Right. Well, right. think about it like this. You go back 150 years. And the only way anybody had to get ice was out of nature. People would, um, you know, essentially harvest big blocks of frozen ice from lakes and rivers. Right, and that's right. We didn't have thermodynamics in those days, right? Right. Well, we yeah. hadn't discovered what we had for thermodynamics. We, right. had discovered we didn't discover this. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, fair point. So, you know, the point is that, um, you know, we had these insulated boats that are shipping ice all around. And when you had the advent of industrial refrigeration, all of a sudden, we had a way to make the same experience of ice, but with human made technology rather than made by nature. Right. And the ice barons of that era were livid because there was a huge ice industry back then. Yeah. And the ice barons were livid over this new technology. They referred to it as artificial ice and they railed against it. They urged people not to buy it. They said it was unnatural. It went against God. It was unsafe. You didn't know it was in it. And of course, you fast forward to today and we all have artificial ice makers in our homes. We call them freezers. Hey, we don't it think changed our ability to keep things in our house and refrigerate and everything like that. Right. And so the point is human made ice is superior to yeah. ice that was made in nature, right? It's a better experience. Cleaner, and nobody referred, right? right? It is cleaner. And in fact, yeah. it, was even, it was even cleaner in the, in the 19th century uh, for a variety of reasons. One, you know, they, they had horses who were, you know, hauling all this ice out of the rivers and they weren't exactly holding it in while they're pulling it out. So, right. uh, and, 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 and like you know, it was the industrial revolution too. So a lot of the waterways were polluted. Yeah. What would they do? Uh, so, they would deliver these giant blocks of ice like to towns or something on a... Oh, does it they melt do by the time you get there? No, they had insulated boats that shipped it all the way oh, to India. 
Oh, yeah, it's that, okay. it was actually quite an interesting industry because Indians did not want ice. You know, who did want ice is the British colonizers because they were trying to live in the subcontinental heat. Right. And so there was actually quite an industry of, uh, of sending insulated boats filled with ice to the uh, British colonizers in India. Interesting. You don't think about these things you know, nowadays. We just take yes. it for granted, you know? That's right. And so the point, though, is now nobody refers to it as artificial ice or an ice substitute, right? We just right. say it's ice, even though it's made by human technology. Similarly, you know, we don't call a cell phone a fake landline. We don't call, you know, a, you know, a digital photo a fake photo or a photo right. substitute. Like these are just ways of having the same experience, except better and with better technology. So in the Good. same way that when you flick a light switch on in your room, you know, what you're after is the experience of an illuminated room. You just want light. You're not thinking, is this coming from coal or oil or exactly. solar or wind? You just want light. I think the same is so with meat. I think most people, when they eat meat, they're not thinking, oh, I'm so glad. In no, animals. not at all. No, right. not at all. Right. They don't think about what happened to get that meat to their plate. It's not even a not even a moment of contemplation. And yeah. if there were a moment of contemplation, most people would probably say, you know, I would rather an animal not be slaughtered for this. Right. And so, and, and so. What we at my company, The Better Meat Co., and what my book, Clean Meat, is about is trying to create the meat experience without the need to raise and slaughter animals. And so to go back to your initial question, Mitch, you know, I've long been concerned, yes, about the treatment of animals, but also about how humanity will feed ourselves sustainably into the future. Because as I mentioned, the planet isn't getting bigger. We're not going to be farming the moon. We're not going to be farming Mars. We have one celestial body to farm. And as we continue to increase our demand for meat right now, we continue to deforest the planet. Uh, meat, yeah. The meat industry is the number one cause of deforestation on the planet. Yeah. And so the question is like, okay, well, the, the 7.8 billion of us who live on earth now want to eat more meat. And we're, you know, presuming there's no catastrophe that fails our numbers in the next 30 years, there's gonna be another 2 billion humans on the planet. Like just population growth alone is gonna add 2 billion, even if sure. we didn't have increases in demand. Right. From the carbon emissions set. go up and you don't have plants to, filter them out and change right. them. Now let me now let me just clarify things. This is we're talking about a new way to produce meat, a better way to produce meat. We're not talking about like impossible burgers where they're synthesizing meat-like things out of animal out of, you know, plant protein so it tastes like meat. We're talking about a better way to produce meat, is that correct? There's three ways to do it. Okay. One of which is the, the one of which is uh, two of which you just referenced. So you know, companies like Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat, they go to the plant kingdom, and right. they you know subject the plants to different kinds of processing to make them taste like an animal, right? So right. you're going to take peas, or you're going to take soybeans, and you're going to process them in such a way that they end up looking like a hamburger. Right. Um, another method is to go not to the plant kingdom, but to the animal kingdom and use animal cells rather than whole animals. And that's what my book, Queen Meat, is about. So in that right. case, you can grow real actual animal meat that's not a meat substitute. It's real animal meat right. that is simply grown without the need to have an animal. You take a tiny, tiny little like biopsy, like a sesame seed sized biopsy from an animal. And within that, there are millions of little microscopic cells that you can then proliferate and grow in a cultivator so that they grow into the same food that we would normally eat today just without slaughter. Then there's a third method. So instead of going to the plant kingdom or to the animal kingdom, you can do what my own company, The Better Meat Co. is doing, which is go to the fungi kingdom and use microbial fermentation. We use little tiny microscopic fungi and we subject them to a special kind of microbial fermentation where okay. we feed them potatoes. And in the same way a cow eats grass and converts that into a steak, okay. our little microbes eat the potatoes and convert it into a food that really does look like animal meat. And it doesn't require much processing, almost straight out of the fermenter, it comes out looking like animal meat. And so you have a, um, uh, with a cow, you know, you have to feed her for, let's say, more than a year to before you slaughter her, whereas our microbes are done with their fermentation in less than one day. So, you know, you can go from inoculating the fermenter to harvesting a meat-like substance that really uh, looks and has the texture of animal meat, um, but is better for you. So it's got no saturated fat, no cholesterol. It's higher in protein than eggs, higher in iron than beef. And it's a real true superfood. And so we can use that as the basis of manufacturing a meat experience without the need to, to use animals. So again, there's plants, there's animals, and there's fungi. And uh, you know, I'm all for them, just like I'm all for wind, solar, geothermal. Like you want lots of options that are in the renewable energy right. space. You want lots of options in the um, in in the animal free meat space too. Okay, so f so fungi, mushrooms, things like that are not really plants. They're in like their own 
category. But if somebody's vegan, I guess they must eat mushrooms, right? So you're right, Mitch. So uh, they're not animals. So, you know, so interestingly, so, you know, fungi are a completely separate kingdom. And just for like, you know, by way of interesting fact, so you got plants and you got animals, right? Mm -hmm. And then you've got fungi, but fungi are not in the middle. They're way closer to animals. So it's really interesting because fungi are so much closer to animals that they like animals breathe in oxygen and breathe out CO2. We know plants do the opposite, right? Like plants breathe in CO2. The other end of the chain, right? Right. So fungi, in addition to that, you know, you think about plants, they have put themselves in the sun and they photosynthesize. That's how they get their energy. Fungi don't do that. Fungi, like animals, they have to go out and search for their food and digest and eat it. So that's, they do that for a root like structure called mycelium. And so the point is that fungi are way closer to animals than plants are. And it's for that reason, there's a category of fungi called filamentous fungi, which actually have a far more meat-like texture to them than plants do. And so this is one reason why many people, myself included, are bullish on the microbial fermentation space because you can use these microscopic fungi and essentially through uh, the, the parameters of a fermentation, coax them into uh, making a meat-like product without all the processing that you have to do in order to make a plant-based meat. So are these any, like for example, mushroom names that I'm familiar with as a lay person, street person? <laughs> Yeah, so many of the species that are used are names that you would be familiar with, shiitake, my, uh, shiitake and reishi okay. and so on. However, um, you know, in the microbial fermentation, companies like ours are not using mushrooms. We're using mycelium. So that's the root-like structure underneath the fungi. Got so it. think about it like this. Like a, a mushroom is the fruiting body of the fungi. And so a mushroom is kind of like the apple on the tree to use a plant equivalent, right? Okay. The, the mycelium is the, the trunk and the roots of the fungus. And so it is a very different tip to just in the same way the roots of a tree are very different from the apple than the, from the fruit. Uh, the mycelium is very different from the mushroom. And so we are using fungi, but not necessarily mushrooms to, to create this meat experience. So does the mushroom itself not work? The process doesn't work? You need the mycelium to make it work? Or is it just because it's more abundant or easier to work with? Um, yeah, so there's a few things. One, mushrooms don't have much protein, whereas the mycelium is totally protein packed. So that's one benefit. Uh, two, mushrooms grow pretty slowly, whereas you can actually, in a fermenter, get the mycelium to grow very rapidly. So if you think about how long it takes for a mushroom to grow, you might be waiting weeks, whereas with the mycelium, you can actually grow it in less than a day. Okay, I know we got off the track and we got started talking about all kinds of stuff. So what, what's your background? Where are you, where are you, <laughs> you know, from, educated? get started yeah. in business, things like that. Sure. So uh, Mitch, I'm very unqualified for my job as the CEO <laughs> and founder of this company. As you'll, right. as Except you own the company that makes you very qualified. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. That is a good, you know, they, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to get rid of me. Um, so, <laughs> you know, look, I have long been concerned about food sustainability and, and agricultural practices. So I devoted about 20 years of my career from, hold on a second, sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. All right. Take, we'll, we'll take two. Okay. <laughs> Mitch, I, I have been uh, devoted much of my life to agricultural sustainability. So uh, I spent the first 20 years of my career out of college where I went to George Washington University mm. and uh, really uh, as a lobbyist uh, working to pass uh, public policies to address these kinds of issues about how we're going to sustainably feed humanity into the future. Is that the problem, in D.C.? Uh, yeah. You're in D.C. Right. Okay. But yeah. George, George Washington is in St. Louis though, right? Not GW, that George Washington is, right? Uh, I went to GW, GW, so George Washington University, which so is you, in DC. You were in DC, okay, yeah, DC yeah. is a great town. Okay, so you were in DC it for is. college yeah. and you stayed yeah. and went to work for lobbyists, okay. Yeah, and, and I was born in DC proper. I went to high school in DC oh, proper. So, so I was born and bred, I, local guy. I, I, yeah, I was like an inside the beltway you can have kid, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I really believe that uh, public policies are always going to you know, help to address this problem. And I still think that I still think public policies are absolutely critical. However, I really believe that technology and entrepreneurship probably can do more. And I'll give you an example. So if you think about like to use the example of a lit room again. So think about how, for example, uh, you know, 150 years ago, at the same time that insulated boats of ice were going around, there were a lot of whaling ships and because that's how people with their homes, with whale oil. And there were lots of concerns about whether whaling could possibly be sustainable because we were killing tons of whales back then. Right. Yeah. And, and what ended up freeing whales from harpoons was not sustainability concerns. It wasn't humane sentiment. 
it was simply the invention of kerosene because an right, it was an alternative, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. So an entrepreneur named Abraham Gesner, who is a Canadian geologist, invented a way to get kerosene, and it was a much cheaper, cleaner way to light our homes. And that did more to save whales than anybody who actually cared about whales, because of course Gesner did not care about whales. Same thing with the, with horses. You know, we used to only be able to get around by whipping horses and forcing them by threat of violence to carry right. us and our goods around. And the animal welfare organizations of the 1860s and 70s crusaded for these horses. They tried to get laws passed to get better working conditions. They wanted mandatory watering stations, resting hours, Sabbath days, so they couldn't be worked on the Sabbath. And it, you know, Henry Ford was this entrepreneur who didn't care about horses, but he did more to liberate horses than you know, any animal advocate did in that era. And so I truly believe the same is so with the factory farming of animals, which I am very concerned about. I think it's a horrible thing that we're doing to animals and to the planet, but I believe that it's not going to be humane sentiment necessarily alone that's going to help solve this problem. It's going to be entrepreneurs and scientists and investors who invent a new method of producing a meat experience that renders the old method obsolete, just like kerosene did just with whales, just like cars did with horses. We can create meat experiences that are so superior that the, in our, the future, our descendants will say, ah, I'm so glad that we don't have to raise and slaughter animals anymore. In the same way that today we say, oh, we're so glad we can make ice in our homes. And we're so glad that we don't have to have horses carrying us around anymore. Well, I think in the future, people are saying, I'm so glad we don't have to subject animals to the torturous conditions that we do in order just to eat meat, because now we can produce meat through technology rather than through raising and slaughtering animals. No, I mean, people are not really motivated on the the general welfare of society. That's one of the problems, right? Is that, okay, so you and I recycle. I'm not sure if we do it right, but we recycle and our community has a recycling program and so forth. But what about the 3 billion people in China? Are they recycling? People are using different things that hurt the environment. We stop using concrete. They're using, I mean, it's just a very big, vast thing. But what I wanted to ask you was, if you go back when you worked in Washington and you were lobbying, what, what were the issues of the day? If you go back 20 years ago, we weren't talking about impossible burgers and things like that. No. We were talking about, where were the, yeah, what are the yeah. issues that are going on then? Uh, primarily the treatment of animals on farms. And so really, um, uh, we were, uh, I was a part of a number of campaigns that passed laws to restrict the ways that farm animals could be confined. So for example, um, you know, it's, it's customary in the pig and the pork and the uh, egg industries to lock animals in cages where they can't even move basically for their whole right. lives. And so um, I was a part of campaigns to uh, ban that practice in a variety of states. We never succeeded in Congress, but you know, there's about 15 states now that have restricted those type of inhumane practices. And I do think that there will come a day when Congress will restrict those practices as well. The European Union has already done so, other nations have done so. Eventually, I think the US will catch up and do that. But I do think like you know, part of the reason why I wanted to both write the book Clean Meat and then start this company, The Better Meat Co., uh, was out of this fear that I was like one of these animal welfare crusaders trying to get better conditions for the horses. Right. You know, like I think it's good to do. I mean, I, I would like for well, better. Of conditions course, for but them. unless it's legislated right. and it, it, unless there's a penalty for doing it or it's there's a better, cheaper, more, more efficient alternative that benefits people, forget just, yeah. you know, from a health standpoint. They really don't. I mean, look at cars, right? I mean, we're just starting to move to electric cars because it's becoming more popular and people are wanting to do it and the prices are going down. But if it wasn't for Elon Musk starting Tesla, and a lot of people thought he was nuts. Now the yeah. cost of batteries are going down, the technology is being looked at. And in 20 years, we probably won't have a lot of gas cars. It won't be gone, but we won't have a lot of gas cars. Right. And people will be and people will be glad. They'll be they'll say, I'm so glad we don't have to do it the way that we once did it. Right. And and that's really the key here, because, you know, in the same way that it's easy for us now to look back and say, oh, whaling is so barbaric. Right. Or I would never whip right. a horse. Um, you know, I think that our descendants are going to look back and they're going to say, I can't believe what they did. They used to eat, uh, eat animals, cut their head off and. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and lock, and, and, I mean, and, and lock them in cages for months yeah. on end where they couldn't move. Yeah. Well, it's good uh, I mean, for the meat, bad for the bird, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. So, I mean, I just think like, you know, the technologies that we are inventing are imperative to reach that type of a future where our relationship with our fellow animals on this planet is no longer one that's just, you know, based on violence and domination, but really one that can be based on compassion and respect because we aren't reliant on their exploitation anymore. And that's the type of future that I'm working toward. That's why I started the Better Meat Co. And that's what I want to achieve with our company is to create a better way so that people can satisfy their meat tooth, so to speak, 
but creating a more humane future. Yeah, well, you you give me some hope because I, I'll be honest with you, I don't think, and look, I recycle and, you know, I don't have an electric car right now, but, you know, I definitely am, you know, energy conscious and I'm, I'm conscious of everything that we're doing. But I think, you know, we're such, like you said before, a complex society of, for lack of a better term, consumers, right? People that consume things, we consume energy, we consume food, we consume whatever, we use things up that it's almost an insurmountable task. I'm not saying that, you know, all of this effort doesn't prolong things, but I think you go a couple thousand years down the road, we got a big problem. And, and because you can't get it, everybody doesn't just get together and they say, okay, let's do this. They're all kind of competing interest company, you know, countries fighting each other, companies competing for this and that. And it seems like an insurmountable, you know, task in the long run, in the short run, I think you can make a big impact. You come up with different food alternatives. You come up with sustainability, you know, ratings. Uh, I think one of the airlines said they're going to, you know, a zero carbon footprint by um, a certain year, which I think people don't even understand what that is. You know, you can't, and as an airline using jet fuel, fuel not emit carbon, but what they're going to do is they're going to buy carbon credits, I guess, and plant sustainable things in the jungle that then absorb the carbon. So in a zero sum game, they are carbon neutral, but they're not really inventing an airplane that flies without jet fuel. I mean, we both know right. that. So, that's, that's right. you know, but then if you look at things, like you said, with animals that destroy plants that are carbon, you know, um, absorbers, you know, then there's a problem. So then everybody kind of has to, you know, have their, but I'm hoping, you know, look, like the ice example and like the horse example, right? It took a good generation or two to really forget what we used to do with horses. And now we just, you know, everybody drives cars. I mean, it's just, that's right. what it is. Too many cars now, right? You're going on the road and it's nuts. Yeah, you know, that, yeah right. And, too many and, cars and think, on the road. It's just crazy. Right. And, and think about, you know, for a very long time, the only way humans had to get around that wasn't by foot was basically on four hooves, right? And now, if somebody was using a horse-drawn carriage, you would look at them as if they were completely insane. Right. Like they must be like devoted to some religious cult or They're something. They're Amish. Like, They're living in Pennsylvania. Right. You know? <laughs> right. Like, you know, and, and yet that was the norm. Like people couldn't understand it. You know, Henry Ford famously said, if I had asked the public what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And right. Well, that isn't that why they used horsepower as the as the measure right. of the engine to begin with? I mean, now it's silly, right? 350 horsepower. You're not going to hook yeah. 350 horses up <laughs> to a car. But in those days, right. I guess there was equivalent, right? They're like this right. is two I mean, horsepower. OK, right. Uh, yeah. I mean, and, and keep in mind, like horses were so ubiquitous that even after rail cars were invented, they still were transported by horses. Like for when railroads were invented, the first rail cars were by teams of horses pulling along the tracks. Yeah, because there was nothing to pull them, right? Right, right. It, you know, it wasn't until like the mid 18th century or so when steam engines started coming around that you, you had a better way. But, you know, for a very long time, people could only think about horses as a mode of transportation. And now, blink of an eye later, historically speaking, you would be perceived as being insane if you were utilizing a horse for your transportation. And I think that's I don't even think you're allowed. Thing. Are you and I allowed if we got a buggy and hooked a horse up? Could we go on public roads? I don't know. Probably I don't know. not. I don't know the answer to that, but that would be an interesting thing to find out. Yeah. But I, I think the same is going to be so with meat that, you know, we've thought about meat as synonymous to us today as a hunk of flesh from a once living animal's body. Uh, but in the future, I think people are going to have a far more diverse view of what meat entails. Yeah. And meat will be a type of experience that you eat just in the same way that uh, photographs are far more diverse today than they were, let's say, 100 or even 50 years ago. Um, where, you know, it doesn't no longer involves negatives and gelatin film and all the chemicals and dark rooms that were inherent to the uh, method of capturing your memories. Yeah. Well, you know, I think the same thing is going to happen with meat. Yeah. But I think it's going to take a long time. It's going to take 50 to 100 years to get to the point where we have, I mean, not, I'm not, maybe, maybe 50 years. It's going to take a long time. There's, there's a lot of guys oh. like you doing what you're doing or labs that are growing duck breast or whatever. I mean, is there a lot of that going on or it's still a small industry. Um, you know, there's billions of dollars of investment going into this space right now. It's one of the hottest spaces for investors. Okay. Well, that's and promising. So uh, I, I would say, you know, look, there, it, it could be well, it could well be that it's going to take 50 years, but it's not going to be nothing. And then 50 years later, there's no, of course a, not. Right. You know, like, I, I do think like there will be in the coming five or 10 years, 
that diversification will start to be seen more. I mean, already we're seeing fast food companies putting plant-based burgers on their menu that right. really do, you know, uh, taste like meat and, and look like animal meat. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's a pretty good sign um, of, of the things to come. Do you know anything about statistics? Like, are they selling well? Is it a popular item on the fit? I mean, I don't go to those places anymore, Burger King and McDonald's yeah, the, or whatever. Uh, the last time I read an article about it, I read that the Impossible Whopper was about 2% of sales of burgers at, at Burger King. Right. Um, so yeah, it's not nothing, um, but it's still pretty I mean, modest. well, their clientele is generally, you know, they're not a clean eating population. I mean, it's because because it's you're talking less expensive food, not organic. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't like think I, I, I don't think anybody who goes to Burger King is thinking that they're getting health food. Um, they're, you know, <laughs> exactly. I think I'm like I am, I'm getting a kale salad here. Yeah. Um, but you know, a lot of people go there and they want they want a burger, and Impossible was able to satisfy that for them without Pretty without sure, right. maybe all of the land and water and animals needed the, the way to make the conventional Whopper. Right. Uh, I think uh, Dunkin' Donuts has a Impossible sandwich too for breakfast or something like that. Uh, yeah, that's cool. Place. Yeah, that's cool. It tastes that's pretty awesome. good. I, I don't I don't want to get too much in the weeds, like into the science of it, but I, I am curious and interested about how the you know how this how this happens, not just on the mi microbial um, or what was the word mycelium mm -hmm. process where you're using fungi or how they're growing this meat in a lab. Like what what happens and why does it happen and what led to that discovery? to do this i'd like to yeah. know the whole kind of am i getting too much into the uh, no 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 not at all mitch so you know the very first uh recorded recipe for a plant-based meat okay actually actually goes back more than 1000 years to ancient china and so you know a lot of buddhists uh, obviously don't want to eat meat since the first precept of buddhism is not to kill and you um so there's a huge Buddhist population in China back then. And so they wanted to eat meat without the need to kill animals. Right. So uh, you go back more than a thousand years for that very first recipe of, okay. uh, of plant-based meat. You then fast forward to the 19th century and pretty much nothing had happened until John Harvey Kellogg came along and he was a great proponent of vegetarianism. Like so Kellogg, like the yeah. cereal company? Okay. That's exactly right. Yeah. So uh, interestingly, the two big proponents of this diet back then were John Harvey Kellogg and Sylvester Graham. So of Kellogg cereal and Graham crackers. There you go. So, uh, so these guys were like both pioneers in the space and Kellogg actually patented the very first ever plant-based meat recipe and it was in 1899 the very first okay. patent on plant-based meat that he that he filed uh, then you fast forward to like the 1970s and you start seeing companies like uh, light life and tofurkey starting to make uh more advanced plant-based meats but they were designed for vegetarians not right. for meat eaters right they were almost like you know like a, like a consolation prize right like if you're going to a barbecue and you know there's a vegetarian yeah. there you have this for them uh, then you come into uh, you know, the more modern times and you start seeing companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods mm -hmm. trying to develop plant-based uh, plant products that are designed not for vegetarians, but for people who want meat. Yeah. You know, like this is designed to, you know, it's kind of like the Tesla, right? Like somebody, they don't care about the environment per se. Like they just but want it's a cool. because- It's a great yeah. technology. Yeah, of course. Right. It, it, if it happens to be better for the environment, that's great. But it's like, you know, it goes zero to 60 rapidly, right? Right. So, you know, that's the, uh, that's, I, I would compare like beyond it impossible to like the Teslas of this particular space. And now you see not just companies that are, you know, advanced in turning plants into meat like experiences, but you see companies that are just making meat, real animal meat. Right. And, and that's like the latest thing. Those products are not yet on the market in the United States, but they will no. be. They're uh, available in no. other parts of the world. Uh, well, in Singapore, they're selling them and Qatar just announced that they were going to approve the sale of it as well. But the U.S. Um, is on the cusp of approving it because the Department of Agriculture uh, recently issued a call for comments on how to label these meats when they hit the market. So, you know, this is going to be a real bad battle between the conventional meat industry and this meat industry, this new meat sure. industry, about what it's called. Um, you know, it's kind of like the old artificial ice debate. And so... Uh, we will have these types of meats on the market in the United States in the coming years, um, but it'll be some time before they're, you know, on Costco shelves. So you might see like, you know, like it is now, it's shrink wrapped uh, meat, like a breast, and it'll say like, you know, organically grown in a lab or something like that. <laughs> 
I doubt it would say a lab because it won't it won't be lab produced. It'll be produced in a factory just like most okay. food products are. But it, you, it might say something like cultivated meat or right. cultured or even cultured meat. So um, those are the cultured types of meat. terms. There you go. Yeah, so that's what they're doing. You know, these companies are, are culturing meat cells. So that's uh, that's how they're doing it. And uh, those that labeling debate will be an important one because, you know, already the uh, the livestock industry is lobbying to pass laws to require very unsavory labels on these products. Of course. Well, they did that with. Um, what are they doing that with? With now they're doing it with milk. They were doing right. it with. Dog, you know, like hot dogs and burgers. They didn't want, you know, if that shouldn't be a burger if it's a can't use. Yeah, that right. Name. I mean, they want to protect the livelihood. I, I understand. Look at the Luddites when back in the 1800s, so when they were coming up with all those machines, they're like, the world's going to come to an end. We can't. Well, some of the industries disappeared. The people that are making clothes and stuff. I mean, that changed. Right. So they're trying to yeah, hold it, up the livelihood. I understand. You know. Right. You know, it's interesting though because there's kind of a divide niche between the uh, meat industry on this. So if you go back to the photo example, you go to back to the 1990s and you had Kodak and you had Canon. They're vying yeah. for supremacy in the in the film market, and they both knew about digital. They both knew about digital, but Kodak right. was concerned it was going to cannibalize its core business of negatives and print photography and the one-hour photoshops and everything else. Yeah. And uh, Canon though said, even though this will cannibalize, we should embrace it because we think it's the future. And we all know what happened. So Kodak went bankrupt and Canon yep. is now the largest manufacturer of digital cameras on the planet. Yeah. And so there are many it. companies. Yeah, there are many companies in the meat space that are like the Kodak that are like, hey, we have always slaughtered animals. We're going to keep slaughtering animals. But there are a lot of companies in the meat industry that are also saying, hey, we want to be more like Canon. Right. And we know like we want to supply good quality, nutritious, delicious protein for our customers. And the method of doing so doesn't matter to us. If we can do it without having to slaughter animals, we'll embrace that. And so, you know, companies, for example, like Hormel, you know, which is the maker of Spam, now yeah. have their own, they'll have their own plant-based meat line. And that's well, if you told me big... spam was made in the lab too, I, I would be like, oh yeah, I, I'm not surprised. You know? <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> that's yeah. the joke yeah. meat, right? It's, it's in a can. Oh, well, yeah, it's a pretty popular <laughs> product though. But I, I will say, you know, there are companies like Hormel that really are forward thinking and that I think are positioning themselves to be more like the Canon than the Kodak. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting because is Polaroid even in business anymore? Does somebody buy that technology? I, I don't know. I mean, there are there are like instant cameras now Fuji yeah. makes them or whatever, but yeah, they're like the uh, uh, the blockbuster of yeah, video right. rentals. I mean, they missed that whole boat, and That's you right. know, it's a shame that Kodak was that short sighted. But I think you're right. I think that look, this is not going to change unless the meat in like you're not going to turn everybody into a vegetarian. It's just not going to happen. We're carnivores for to a large portion. People like eating meat. They're not going to give it up, but you have to have meat alternatives for them that they can make that choice instead of having to buy a, a, a Boca burger or bean, black bean burger or whatever, because, you know, I mean, that's what Impossible Burger is doing, right? They recognize, and I think you do too, that the people that they're looking to get to are not the vegetarians. They're, they're the easy ones. It's the 90%. I don't know how much the percentage is, but there's a large percentage of the yeah. earth's population that want to eat meat. So they're right. going to so, solve the yeah. problems, give them alternatives. Right. So in America, you know, it's probably about 97% of people eat meat. That, and, that, that much. Huh? Yeah, it's a very small right. part of the population. They're vegetarians. That's right. And look, I would be overjoyed, Mitch, if people were happy to eat rice and bean burritos and lentil soup and hummus. Yeah. Like, that'd be I mean, great. it's healthier but, for them, too. Right. You know. Trust me, I, I'm all for it. I think it's wonderful. Are you a vegetarian? I, no. Yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, I, I became plant based decades ago and I love doing it. But at the same time, I agree with what you're saying, which is that you got to play the cards as they're dealt. And the cards that have been dealt are that nearly all humans want to eat meat. However, not nearly all humans demand that meat be coming from animal slaughter. I don't think and, anybody does, right? Right. Very few. Very few. I mean, you and don't go so, to a restaurant and say, was this, was this animal slaughtered? I'm not eating right. any meat that was not slaughtered. I want an animal right. that yeah. was mistreated, <laughs> died for the cause, you know. Yeah. I want these I want animals with hope walking around being treated well at farms. I want them to have no hope. Right, Feel exactly. guilty about right, that stuff. Right. No, nobody's saying, ah, I wish this animal had suffered more. Right. Um, you know, look, I, I agree with that. And so I think we can give people, like, basically let people have their meat and eat it too. Like, that's yeah. the real idea. And so I, I would be thrilled for people to even eat less meat. It would be great, like, if people just wanted to eat 
um, you know, like um, there's a cookbook author, a former New York Times writer named Mark Bittman. And he has a cookbook where he calls it vegan before six. And that dude eats vegan before 6 p.m. And after 6 p.m. eats whatever he wants. And, you know, that's a pretty good strategy for him. You know, it's, it makes means two thirds of his meals are, are totally plant based. Yeah. And if it's a healthier more, way to live. Yeah. If 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 more people would do that, you know, you could really see how we can get towards solving this problem. Um, so at the same time, though, look, I agree. People want meat. We got to give it to them and yeah. we just have to force it from animal slaughter. All right, so so let's talk about your product line availability of your product because I know we talked about this when we first met and where it's being used and how it's being used and how look maybe I'm listening and I'm like wow I want to eat better meat so how do I how sure. do I do this so tell me about the company and the products and things sure so my company the Better Meat Co is a B two B ingredients provider so we don't have products that you're going to see out on the shelf of a supermarket with our logo on them rather we supply other companies including actually Hormel Foods so I just mentioned okay um, so what we do is we provide ingredients for food manufacturers to make really delicious either animal free meat experiences or blended hybridized products so in the same way we have hybrid cars more and more meat companies are hybridizing their meats so that you're they're combining plant proteins and animal proteins to get the best of both worlds so you get a healthier product with a lower footprint on the planet so for example we supply purdue farms the chicken company with uh, products for them to make their purdue chicken plus products Purdue Chicken okay. Plus is 50% plant-based and 50% chicken. And uh, it's very popular. The Food Network named it the best tasting frozen chicken nugget in America. And it's now grown to be 20% of Purdue's frozen chicken nugget sales. So, so therefore they can, they use up less meat to make the product. And right. it's a healthier alternative because I'm not eating everything meat. I got some vegetables in there uh, on meat. Yeah. Product. That, that's exactly right. So you, it's, okay. it's less saturated fat, less cholesterol, fewer calories, and it tastes better. <laughs> I mean, it really is better meat. Uh, so that's the- Can I um, get those? I'm in New Jersey. Can I get those in the supermarket? Anywhere, yeah. Purdue, Walmart, go, every, go they sell Walmart, it everywhere. Walmart, Whole Foods, anywhere, yeah. Wherever you want. Just look for Purdue Chicken Plus and you'll see that product. What's Hormel doing with it? Hormel uses our mycelium ingredients to make animal-free meat prototypes. Okay, and there's prototypes, so there's nothing out there yet. Yeah, they're in the R and D phase with our products right now, so um, they're uh, making these animal free meat prototypes, but we are not in the market with that product yet. So you're really at the forefront of this whole movement. I mean, you know, you're just developing products; not everyone's using them yet. So you got it on both sides. You got to work on the R and D, right? You got to work on the usage and the inclusion and get the customers. Now, who who you have? How many customers do you have in terms of a span of companies that you're that are either looking at your product or using your product in their in their production process? Uh, well, in terms of companies who are looking at our product, you know that's more than a hundred. But in terms okay. of companies who we sell to, it's about a dozen. And what we're doing is essentially creating ingredients that through fermentation that if somebody likes a lot and they want to really scale up and commercialize it, we will have to build a bigger fermenter. So we are uh, currently looking at building a fermenter that is about 15 times bigger than what we currently have to satiate the demand for our mycelium products. So uh, we're going to raise- You do have a demand. I mean, you have a capacity issue. You, you have plenty of demand so, right now. We could literally, Mitch, we could literally quintuple our supply and not be able to produce enough to satisfy the demand right now. Um, it's oh, it's a whole well, that's yeah. a promising thing, though, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's promising, but it's frustrating because we want to make an impact and we have to scale up, and we we just haven't done that yet. So it involves raising tens of millions of dollars to build the infrastructure. Like you know, we need to build a fermenter literally the size of an office building, and uh, that just Thanks. takes you know, yeah, it's a lot of capex. Um, so. Uh, we're though in the process of doing that. We have uh, we've uh, determined a location, and now we're going to go out and raise the money and uh, build this thing. So, have you you did you raise money before? Is this your first round of seed financing? Uh, no, we've raised over twenty million dollars in funding oh, from investors so a lot far. Of capital. Okay. Yeah, not for this space. I understand that's a lot of capital for uh, in in like real world dollars, but in the in like the biotech food tech space, that's yeah, that's it's not. Great. Yeah, it's, it's not that. It's not that a lot much. of research and development. Well, I mean, I think, uh, well, now they're worth 1.7 billion, but I think Moderna was like losing 400 million a year with all of their biotech stuff that they're, you know, it, that's part of the space, right? I mean, 
Yeah. You're right. doing science. I mean, that's what you're doing, right? It's yeah, it's food that's right. science. That's exactly what it is, right? That's exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. Okay. So I'm um, I'm interested to see. I want to follow your uh your trajectory. How many employees do you guys have now? 16. And I guess if you build a fermenter that's the size of a building, you're gonna need a few more, right? Yeah, maybe more than a few. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I definitely want to stay in touch. I wanna and I'm gonna look for your products. Anybody listening. You know, look for the Purdue product on online. I mean, on, on shelves. Definitely check out your website. We'll put links in the show notes, and people can follow what's going on. Get your book, listen to it, learn about the business. I think I think a lot of this stuff comes with education. And if you're interested of educating yourself as a consumer, I mean, right, as to what's really going on in the world and how you can make a difference. Well, you can make a difference by paying attention to these things that are going on and participating in the process. Doesn't mean you have to become a vegetarian. But it means that, you know, there's people like you that are out there bringing some hope to the table, so to speak. Well, thanks, Mitch. I appreciate it. And I appreciate what you're doing to promote entrepreneurship. I think it's such a crucial part, not only of our economy, but to solving the most pressing problems that humanity faces. So I'm grateful to you. Well, I appreciate it. I uh, don't know what kind of impact I'm making on a regular basis, but hopefully we'll give people some thoughts and ideas. Um, Before we sign off, what would you say as an entrepreneur were, you know, one or two of the, of the more difficult challenges you think you faced both starting and growing a company? Uh, yeah, there've been so many, it's hard yeah. to pick from them. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of what the great philosopher Rocky Balboa said when he, uh, <laughs> when he said, you know, in life, it's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. And, you know, the process of starting your own company and trying to create something from nothing is very difficult. There's a lot of down days, uh, but there are good up days too. And I think it's important to take a moment to reflect and appreciate those good times while they last because they they won't last, you know, right. uh, hor- hor- horrible things would happen. But to answer your question directly, Mitch, you know, having uh, key people leave the company, uh, you know, is always hard. Like if, you, if we had a um, the person who I started the company with, uh, she and I ran the company for the first year and a half and then she had a... Uh, a uh, pretty substantial problem in her personal life that was completely unrelated to the company, but still necessitated her to leave. Yeah. And it was, you know, that was an extremely stressful uh, time to deal with that. Uh, other really stressful events have involved, um, you know, trying to satisfy customer demands when the supply chain went into chaos during COVID. Yeah. Um, you know, we rely on commodity ingredients. And I mean, even now with, you know, with the pandemic hopefully receding into the past, even now those supply chains are complete. Hard you know, to get. Complete yeah, they're a mess. They're a mess. And, and, you know, it's a shame because that means for us, we have to, you know, have longer lead times for our customers, higher prices for our customers. Um, it's, it's a horrible place to be in. You know, we want, you know, we want to continually do better for our customers, get them better prices and better service. And the supply chain chaos is causing us to do the opposite of that. So yeah, well, I think that's we great. learned a lot about logistics and supply chains with, during the yeah. pandemic, but I, I think that's a, a recurring theme, you know, mindset and perspective goes a yeah. long way when you run yeah. into the obstacles of running a business there, you're not going to avoid them. I, somebody told me the other day, they would rather make a lot of little mistakes along the way and learn things than be faced with the big ones because the big ones can kill you yeah can um, can end your business the little ones are just you know you got to deal with things on a daily and weekly and monthly basis right you need to build resilience i mean that's the bottom line that's the that's the covid word i think the pandemic word resilience yeah it's true i mean ben horowitz had a great line where he said that um you know starting your own company will make you sleep like a baby because you're going to wake up every two hours and cry (laughs) yeah i I love that comment because babies don't sleep well that's such a funny comment it's a horrible, it's a horrible expression, but yeah, I mean, and, and that, you know, that's been my experience. It's very difficult to do at the same time, you need to build up resilience. And, you know, when I come home from work every day, my wife always asks me what's the worst thing and the best thing that happened today. And usually they're both pretty dramatic. Yeah. You know, they're usually like, it's not like modest on either side. There's something really good or something really bad that happened. So you just got to, you know, go on the ride. There's good days yeah. and there's bad days. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for sure. Paul, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming on the show and for sharing all your thoughts and, and uh, how you change in the world. I appreciate it, Mitch. Thanks so much, my friend.